Welcome into the Inside Carolina podcast. This is On the Beat podcast, sponsored by Johnny T-Shirt and GiantT-Shirt.com. New host right now. This is Ross Martin. I'm joined by Gregory Hall and Greg Barnes. Tommy has the day off. I want to remember uh, to mention to rate, review, and subscribe to the Inside Carolina podcast to make sure you get all those podcasts right into your stream. Reviewing and rating helps us. And of course, go to Johnny T shirt and giant t shirt.com to get all your UNC football and basketball needs. All right, guys, on the beat, we had uh, Phil Longo, uh, Jay Bateman, and Mac Brown today after UNC's 48 21 victory over NC State. Uh, we're going to get into a little bit of that. We're also going to get into a little bit of basketball at the end of this podcast. So, a little football, a little basketball, a little Virginia preview, and kind of all over the board. And I have some special questions for y'all at the end as well let's get right into it guys um the bat the, the football game what are your initial thoughts you know we don't have a chance to talk about it on a podcast until monday i want to get your quick thoughts on that game greg and i were in the press box uh gregory was watching at home let's go first to you greg thoughts on that game a beat down in chapel hill and, and your column on sunday really sent a message about you know who was a tougher team and kind of where these programs are going yeah, one thing we talked about last week uh, leading up to this game was was because the fact that Devin Leary was out for NC State, State really had to live up to that mantra that they, they push of being the, the tougher, more physical team if they wanted a chance to, to upset UNC. We did not see that. If anything, North Carolina was the tougher team, more physical up front. Uh, the fact that North Carolina had three times as many uh, broken tackles Speaks volumes. Sam Howe had an impressive pancake block that I think we'll be talking about for a long time in this rivalry. Um, and if State's not going to win that intangible area, they really had no shot. And that's essentially how it played out. Yeah, I thought, like, we talked about this run game, you know. We, we knew Bailey Hawkins wasn't going to be the, the best passer. But they had two really good running backs, and I think their offensive line had proven to be pretty good. And they're four and one. So, I mean, I was kind of like, you know, a little concerned about that. And, you know, they had some Lee McNeil. I feel like we didn't hear his name at all. Peyton Wilson, you know, that we thought they had a pretty good defense and a really good running game. And none of that really came to fruition. Gregory Hall, what was your kind of initial thoughts uh, taking a step back and looking at UNC's win on Saturday? I mean, yeah, I mean, I think the main point is the the toughness and losing that battle. But even when Ben Finley came in uh, for Hawkman, he his first drive state score touchdown um, and the rails could have come off for you and see like we've seen the second and third quarter at some point where they get out to a hot start and then the other team kind of figures it out. And then UNC Stevens all of a sudden is like, Oh wait, they actually are capable of scoring the ball, but UNC didn't do that. I mean, it needed the interception, the crazy Don Chapman interception to do that. Um, you and I Ross were talking back and forth about the momentum um, and that play was huge. Uh, so I think, that's the main thing I took away from it is the UNC defense putting a stop to any sort of momentum that state could have built off. Um, and then you look at the yardage. I mean, yeah, state had a lot of passing yards, but they almost doubled their passing yardage in the fourth quarter when the backups came in for UNC's defense with like 10 minutes left. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really, for the, through the first three quarters, under 200 passing yards, finished with 34 rushing yards, uh, it was just a good overall complete game performance, which we have not seen yet. Yeah, I mean, the ball bounced UNC's way, too, on those turnovers. Like, you know, right. turnovers are kind of odd with fumbles, interceptions, and definitely that one in the end zone was was massive. I think that really kind of ended the momentum that State had with Ben Finley. Um, Greg, what did you think about them switching quarterbacks? And what did you see out of Hockman and, and, and what they did with Finley? Because it seems like Finley's going to be the guy for State um, for the foreseeable future, I would think. And obviously, this is not a State podcast, but – uh, what do you think about what you saw from the, those two guys? Well, I think what Finley brought in was kind of a, a spark. Uh, that yeah. offense looked a lot better for, for two drives. And then once UNC adjusted, he couldn't do anything. And I think really what you, you saw when you would kind of go back and, and watch the, the film, uh, they really didn't trust Finley to throwing the ball. He's, he's a young guy. Uh, he did make a few throws down the field, but most of his throws were little swing passes and, and short passing game. Uh, opportunities and when they put Hockman back in in the second half when things started to get out of control that's when he finally started throwing the ball down the field so I, I think Finley is a kid that has potential moving forward but more than anything State needs to get uh, Leary back because as we talked about last week Devin Leary has 
has been one of the better stories in the ACC this year and in terms of how much he's improved. And kudos to the coaching staff. I mean, I thought Jay Bateman had a great scheme. Obviously, the defensive line and, and the front kind of seven played really well in stopping the run. And once you kind of stop them from, from getting anything on the ground, it forces them to throw. And that's where you have these, you know, sacks and interceptions and things like that. And then, you know, Phil Longo kind of did what he did. They, they leaned on the run. It was successful. And they and Sam Howe kind of managed the game and had some big pass plays here and there. Okay, well, that will wrap up our, our state discussion as we move on to kind of this week we had mac brown for about 30 minutes today pull up the notes i had here um i thought it was i don't know it, it was it, it seemed like a little bit of a boring mac brown press conference compared to what we've had in the past um i don't know if anything stood out to y'all I'd like to kind of go to you first gregory on what stood out for mac brown i mean obviously we talked about the young defenders um he talks about you know their game plan uh, for NC State and then heading into Virginia. What was your kind of takeaway from that, Gregory? Yeah, it, it was boring in that he brought <laughs> up the penalties again, which yeah, I feel like he's done that every week about how penalties were high again, but they're going to have to wait to see what the ACC's report was, which we don't get to see about what the, goes over the players. He always brings that up. Um, he went extensively into last year's UVA game, mm-hmm. which I thought was interesting, just because uh, you can tell it's something that's kind of stuck in his mind maybe, or maybe that's just how his mind works. I'm not really sure. Uh, but the one thing that I took away from it is uh, when he was asked about this point in the season, the midway concern, which is an, which was an obvious answer, but also just important that he sees it and he brought it up is the secondary. Uh, you don't have Patrice Rene. He's supposed to be evaluated this week. Storm Duck is still out. All the opt-outs. When we over the off season, we were talking about how it's the deepest position group that the defense has outside of Chas Roger, my demo, and that has slowly gotten weaker and weaker and weaker. And now, if Renee can't play again, you're losing two starters. Obviously, it was Duck and McMichael. Renee has kind of stepped into a starter. So him bringing that up, as he didn't even think about it when he was asked about what's your concern right now, he immediately was like the secondary. Um, which I think is the biggest concern moving forward as far as, as far as depth goes. Yeah. And for injuries, I meant to do this at the top of the podcast. Um, they're going to reevaluate Bo Krause and Patrice, Patrice Renee this week. Both have lower body injuries and Storm Duck is out for this week. Greg, I want to ask you about clock management. Mac was asked about that or, or mentioned it at some point. I think he mentioned it in his intro. Uh, you're a big clock management guy. Um <laughs> He has – doesn't he have an advisor next to him? And what's going on with, with some of the clock management issues? I think in two games now, UNC's had a little bit of issues with, with, with the end of the second half. I know you kind of asked about the defense giving up games into the uh, – giving up points at the end of the quarters or halves. What's your kind of take on on how UNC is right now with not only clock management but how they're operating when uh, – at the end of quarters and halves? Well, let's talk about time management. First and foremost, so yeah, that's not, uh, my area, not my area, but I know you like it. Well, I mean, the first game of the second Mac Brown era was known for how it finished, right? I mean, North Carolina uh, beat Sarah, uh, South Carolina and Charlotte, but what happens? Yeah. Uh, because of poor clock management, South Carolina actually gets the ball back with like five seconds left. Well, Todd so, Gurley actually. Yeah, yeah. We, we see it all the time. It's, it's tough. Like, it's a, it's worthy of discussion. You see it in college and at pro. Right. And then you know, the big thing at the end of the Virginia Tech game, of course, everybody got upset with Dax Holyfield for, for pushing Sam Howell on the head. What was Sam Howell trying to do? He was trying to buy extra time on the clock. Uh, you know, Justin Fuente, of course, defended uh, his players' actions, and I'm sure Mac Brown had a very different uh, take on it. But what we saw uh, you know, against NC State, uh, NC State drives down, scores a quick, easy touchdown in the second quarter, makes it a a 14-7 game. And now we're talking like, wait a minute, Carolina has dominated the entire first half. And there's the potential here for this game to be a one-score game going into halftime, which has been a huge win for Dave Doran. Uh, North Carolina gets the ball. They have three timeouts. They start moving down the field. And after Michael Carter has a nine-yard run uh, on, on first and 10, North Carolina lets 15 seconds run off the clock. And they ultimately end up sitting on one timeout and have to settle for a 40-yard field goal. Uh, Atkins had missed his first one. He makes that one, and then North Carolina kind of runs away with it, so it was no longer an issue. Uh, Mac Brown really defended that decision 
uh, mm -hmm. Monday, which I think is going to draw a lot of uh, probably some more criticism and at least some, some talking points from the fan base. Uh, I find his response interesting because uh, I covered the game that changed all of this. And that's, that's the funny thing. It's the 2010 Music City Bowl. And he brought that up. That's right. And what happened at the end of that game, for those who may not remember, is that North Carolina was scrambling, trying to get a, a field goal attempted in the final seconds to force overtime. Carolina has like 15 guys on the field. Everybody's scrambling, trying to get on and off. So TJ Yates just takes this snap and spikes it with one second left. Well, it's a penalty, right? But because there was no rule in place saying you couldn't do that, North Carolina, all they had was a five-yard penalty. And so no time ran off the clock. Tennessee, of course, was furious about it. Clay Travis, who's a big Fox News guy or Fox, Fox Sports guy now, uh, <laughs> he was covering Tennessee at the time. And I'll never forget him in the postgame press conference, like trying to get Butch Davis to acknowledge that it wasn't fair and it shouldn't have happened. And Butch is like, no, that's actually the rules. Um, it was just a very testy exchange. Um, so funny to see Clay Travis kind of where he's at now. But anyway, so all that to be said, Mac Brown's idea is, look, you have this 10-second runoff now where if you have a penalty in the final 10 seconds of a half, um, the clock just runs off unless you have a timeout that you can use. Now the question becomes, okay, so I understand that at the end of the game, but how often is that going to happen? How often do you see that where a team commits a penalty in that situation? They don't have a timeout available. It's important for them to try to score, and so they have to waste it or they go to halftime or go to the – uh, end of the game without having a, a timeout that they can use 10 seconds right off the clock. You don't see it very often. So you're really playing the odds there. Uh, but he's, he's adamant that he's got to have a timeout in his pocket in case that situation arises. Um, and so we could have a long, long debate about that. But that's kind of where he stands. I think a lot of people don't agree with him on that. Um, but to your initial point, Ross, uh, he's the one that makes the decisions on timeouts. He's told us before, if Phil Longo or Jay Bateman want to use a timeout, they come to him and say, hey, look, we need to use a timeout for this reason. And he makes that decision. Um, but, you know, it's not, it's not like anybody who wants to call a timeout can do it. It's got to go through the head coach. Now, this is why I'm probably stupid asking this. You get – how many timeouts do you get for the whole game? You get three per half. Three per half. Okay. Got it. No and they're, they're, they're no, done. no carryover. Exactly. Okay. Just like in, in basketball, they don't carry over either, right? Or they yeah, do they carry do. over. They do you lose yeah. one at halftime, though. Right. Yeah. yeah. And Not Roy, even. when Roy doesn't even use it at the end of the first half, everyone's like, you lose the timeout. Just call oh, it. You lose one in, in basketball in the first half. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. I'm How great here. is it, though, that this is a topic of conversation about North Carolina's basketball and football coach liking to hoard uh, timeouts? I, th I think it's great. I, I think in I think in basketball it makes more sense to hold on to it because I think in these you have so many more late game scenarios in basketball where you right. do need to stop the clock. I think in bat I think in football the only time you should use it is, is when you know something crazy happens where you you need to stop the clock or in the in the late situation there. So I don't know. I hadn't you really thought stop, about yeah. Like you can you can spike a ball. Yeah. You can have somebody run out of bounds. That yeah. stops the that stops the clock. Basketball yeah. you can't do that. So it'll be interesting to follow that. I mean, I know a lot of players, a lot of teams have like a, a young guy who's, you know, doing all the math and calculating all the numbers or right beside him or, or an analytics guy in the box. Of course, Mac has his, his senior citizen crew helping him out there <laughs> uh, next to him. So I, I thought it was, I thought it was interesting when Mac, even at the end, like the tail end talking about clock management, he was like, and we won a lot of close games. So I like the way we do it. Like he just yeah. like, kind of short there and was like, look, until it screws us over, I'm going to keep doing it. Like, get out of here kind of way. Yeah, I mean, he's a Hall of Fame coach for a reason, I guess. But I don't know. Okay, we'll move on from that. Um, yeah, again, like, you know, Mac Brown, I didn't think it was very electric of a press conference. So we'll move on to the coordinators. And some of that talk about the coordinators, we also was involved in Mac Brown there too. Phil Longo was first. Uh, Greg, you asked him about the balance of the offense. Um, he talked about, obviously, the run game and the pass game. I thought uh, the offensive line was an interesting comment from Longo and Mac Brown. That that seem, that group is really clicking. I'm going to go to you uh, first, Gregory, about the offensive line, what you saw and what improvements you've seen from the offensive line from the first game, second game to, to the now where you know, they really protected Sam. I think some of the um, 
the sacks or, or more coverage sacks. Yeah. And, and the run game. I mean, man, they're opening huge holes, and they have two really great running backs who make that offensive line look great as well. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to say the offensive line has not been good when you've got Javante Williams and Michael Carter consistently rushing for over 100 yards. And you're right about the coverage sacks. Watching that game, uh, even from my very comfortable couch, uh, you could tell Sam was holding on to the ball too long, and that's why he was getting sacked. It wasn't Aleem McNeil blowing up the offensive line. It wasn't a linebacker. It wasn't Peyton Wilson coming in and just absolutely shedding a block and getting to Sam in the first three seconds, um, which is why I brought up the question to Phil Longo about what exactly you're going to do against Virginia because Virginia's run defense, it's not great, but it's one of the better in the ACC with like just over three yards per carry allowed, but their passing defense has been atrocious. They're the worst in the ACC. Um, and early in the season, what I saw from Sam, when he was trying to force those deep throws to Diami against Syracuse and even really against Boston College, he was either trying to hold on to it too long or he was forcing those deep throws and they weren't there. Well, you know going into it that Virginia is not good in the passing defense. So even if that offensive line with how great it's been has been holding, like holding the opponents from getting sacks and blowing up blocks, is Sam going to almost be trying too hard to attack a weak passing defense? That's why I brought up the question of, I know you've been trying to be balanced. When you look at Virginia's defense, they're not a balanced defense. So do you try to attack one way or the other? So it'll be interesting to see moving forward. But yeah, that offensive line, has gotten a lot better across the board. It's not just all Azudu. Yes, he's their best offensive lineman, but Brian Anderson has been great at center, and I've seen him on watch lists at center. When last year we were like, Brian Anderson, he's not quite ready for this. So oh, across the board, they, ha they have definitely improved. Yeah, hey, and Mac Mint. Go ahead, Greg. No, you can finish your thought. On As, and and Mac, Mac mentioned how they kind of gave Anderson some help because Lee McNeil, he's an NFL guy. So they game, they schemed for that. They were ready for that, and it worked out. Uh, kudos for Stacey Searles. You know, getting that offensive line ready without a spring with, with kind of a weird offseason. I mean, this is kind of when it should be clicking based on the time um, that they for were sure. given. So, so good for Coach Searles, and, and it seems like they have a – a good seven-man rotation with Quarion Johnson uh, getting a decent amount of reps. Uh, Greg, what did you see on that? And also, obviously, there's some there was some switching around. We saw it in your scoop about where Azudu's playing and Awesome Richards um, and, and what happened there in the pregame. Yeah, well, first of all, let's say hats off to Brian Anderson because um, he did get some help. But look, when you're going against a guy like Lee McNeil, who's going to be a, I don't know, he'll be a top three-round draft pick probably. I mean, he's had a phenomenal year. Um, he's just a horse. He's just a, a big guy up there. Big up boy. Front. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Anderson did a good job with him last year and uh, did a good job with him this year. As, as Staples has, has pointed out quite often, you know, this offensive line is really built, uh, I don't want to say finesse, uh, but it's not a road paving kind of line. It's not a big Sam boys. Howell pancake block. Line. That's, well, that's right. Well, sure. Uh, so Anderson's, you're not being asked to, just to be a, a beast up front like a Russell Bodine was at times. Uh, but Anderson's, he, he's, he's good in pass blocking. Um, and he did a really good job on Saturdays. I, I think that's a, a credit. Uh, Joshua Zudu, we talked all preseason about how he was such a key piece for this line just because he could play multiple positions. In the first half, he played three positions. He played left tackle. He played right tackle. He played left guard. Um, and that covers up a lot of woes because – you know, Awesome Richards, he had a good first game, and he's really struggled a little bit the last couple of weeks. Um, and I, I think if you look at the, the numbers, North Carolina has really kind of favored that right side when they're running the ball, and that's when they have their most success. And so, uh, you know, Cyril's wanted to switch things up. And so you still are able to get Richards a lot of snaps. He's played, you know, I don't know, 60 snaps in that game. But because you have a Zudu, you can really put him in in, in key situations, and you can move things around. Uh, and it worked out well. On the running game topic, though, I have this question for you guys. Uh, people on the board are talking about Heisman hype for Javante Williams. Here's the question. Who's the best running back on this team? And the reason I ask that is there's a running back on this team who has the most yardage and who's averaging the most yards per carry, uh, and that's Michael Carter. 
What's the question? Who's yeah. the best running back? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Did I forget yeah. to ask that? I asked yeah, yeah. You never asked your question. <laughs> oh, okay. Dude, they're so they're they're great. And I kind of I wrote my my little column where everyone call it after the fact that you know it's like every other game one kind of stands out, the other one stands out, and you kind of based on maybe the touchdowns or who gets the most yards, but. Dude, they're dynamic, and it's the different. It's, it's a great complement the two different styles because you have that bruiser, but he's also so fast and has that breakaway speed too. That's why I think Javante is going to be more of an NFL, you know, all down back. But but Michael Carter is a scat back. Obviously, we all know this. He's a scat back, and he can really break off yards too. And he's so patient. That's the one thing I've noticed, man. His patience is so different. He's a different runner this year than he's been in his first three seasons. He sets up his blocks, and kudos to. Robert Gillespie and, and Phil Longo and, and Stacey Searles, because they're teaching that, I think. I mean, that is a teaching thing when you learn to be patient and, and, and you know, you, you learn from this experience as well, but you're patient with your blocks and you know they're going to be there. You trust your offensive lines. You're seeing that from Carter as well. So it's clicking for both of them. But, I mean, gosh, Javante. better? I, I think Javante is the best. I'd rather have Javante on my team. Got mosquitoes everywhere around here, guys. So if there was only one, like Clemson has, they only have ETA, and you'd rather have Javante Williams? For sure. I'd rather have Michael Carter <laughs> because, yes, Javante Williams is a truck. I mean, you see that. Um, but to Greg's point about the yards per carry, and I think it maybe it's more more of a testament to the offensive line, but when but each back has a wide open hole, Michael Carter gets more yards out of it. I almost think sometimes Javante is looking for contact, whereas Michael Carter's not. Um, because Javante's good at it. And even if he avoids the tackle, which I'm pretty sure he's leading the country in missed tackles or broken tackles. Um, but I still would rather have Michael Carter because of what he can do in special teams. And I think he's better out of the backfield with catching the ball. Um, obviously, Javante Williams is good too. And on that crazy play against Boston College, the 41 yarder that Sam scrambled and found Javante Williams down the seam. As far as swing passes go, I do think that's where Michael Carter is more dangerous. With the Heisman conversation, Javante Williams has 10 touchdowns because he's a better short yardage back because he is looking for contacts. So I think that's why Michael Carter might be the better back, but Javante Williams is in that Heisman. For you, uh, People are saying that as far as Greg's point to that. Javante has broken 41 tackles. <laughs> most, most in the country, right? God, I think it is. That's yeah. Dude, I mean, he just runs that's over insane. I mean, yeah, once he gets in the secondary, I mean, he runs over people. Um, he's I mean, got he's legs. got 375 yards in five games after contact. That's crazy. Where, Where do you get those like, stats? Where do you get the after contact stats? Pro football focus. Gotcha. Man, you, Ross, you, live, you live on that site. I need to get back on there. Ross, what did you learn about why Javante is able to break so many tackles? What did you learn? <laughs> Max says he has big, thick thighs. That's right. <laughs> Like a, a little out of uh, context line there that we want to stay away from. Uh, Greg, have you seen John Bowman's uh, tweets about Javante? I have not. The Choo Choo Train. Yeah, he's on this Javante. He says he's a conductor of the Javante, uh, you know, <laughs> hype train. Him and Pat go back and forth about tweeting out Javante stuff. It's hilarious. Yeah, um, it's, it's it's. I mean, it's awesome to have these two running backs. If you're a UNC fan, okay, let's take a quick break and talk about Johnny T-shirt and GiantT-shirt.com. But um, when we come back, we're going to get into UVA, do a short preview of that game, and then we'll talk a little basketball. So um, that is what you have to look forward to. Johnny T-shirt, giantteacher.com. They are our loyal podcast sponsors right in Chapel Hill. Their headquarters are in Hillsborough, super local. During these times, we definitely want to support the, the local businesses that support us and work together to make sure everyone's doing all right. Uh, sweatshirt season toboggans hats jackets get your jerseys ready to watch those games basketball games at home head to johnny t-shirt and giant t-shirt.com inside carolina podcast sorry inside carolina uh subscribers get 10 percent off all their purchases you know, definitely for for christmas gifts or birthday gifts any big purchases that 10 percent off can make a big difference so head to our message board sign up for inside carolina and get that 10 percent off discount code uh, Johnny T-shirt, they're great, great customer service, very local. And if you go on their website, they have tons of awesome stuff. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I went on there just looking at what they have. And, and it's not just clothes. You can get gifts, trinkets, little things for friends and family, um, and really, really you know, get your 
room and man cave all set up. So Johnny T-shirt and Johnny T-shirt.com. And remember all inside Carolina subscribers get 10% off. We're going to let uh, the national ads come in, pay those bills. We'll be right back and talk a little bit of U and C UVA and get into some basketball talk. We'll be right back. And we're back on the Inside Carolina podcast with Inside Carolina's Greg Barnes and Gregory Hall on The Beat, one of the many great podcasts we have on Inside Carolina. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe. It literally takes one minute to do that. Give us a five-star rating, mash the subscribe button, and write a little nice review telling how much you like our podcasts. All right, guys, UNC is 4-1 and one now. Um, I think this is kind of, you know, I, I think – they could have easily been five and zero, oh, but four and one. I, I think they'll take, you know, you, you, a mishap here and there, and you lose one game. That's what happened against Florida State when they got too too high there on the five on the the, the five ranking there. Uh, they they beat NC State and, and look ahead now to Virginia, um, Duke away, and then Wake Forest. A good little stretch here of kind of the, the old school ACC games and, and all rivals, according to Mac Brown. Uh, Greg, UVA, you, you, you following the, the program the last couple of years under Bronco, Bronco Middenhall. What do you think about them? How do you think UNC matches up with the Cavaliers? And what's your kind of quick takeaways on what's going to happen in that game? Well, one thing that we knew was that w- without Perkins, the offense was going to take a step back. Um, and that's that's clearly what we've seen with, with Virginia. They do have eight returning starters on defense. Uh, and they've been pretty good defensively, but, but not as good as uh, probably we would have thought. Um, and offensively, I think that the Brennan Armstrong kid um, has potential. He's a young guy. He can move. I mean, clearly he's not like Perkins, uh, but he, he can move around a little bit. He's tough. And I know Bronco likes that part of him. But this is you know, somewhat of a rebuilding year. Uh, I didn't expect him to be one and four at this point in time, uh, but they played Clemson tough. They played Miami tough. And then uh, you did not play so well against NC State and Wake Forest. But I think way. Wake is, is peaking at the right time. They're playing a lot better. We'll talk about them more in depth uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, but you, the Miami game last week, I don't know who all watched that, but um, they are tough. They are physical. And so we saw that with Florida State. That was an issue. North Carolina bounced back against NC State. Um, and so, again, if North Carolina can met, match that physicality and that toughness, you have to like their, their chances in this game. It's not going to be an easy win. It's not going to be be a game where North Carolina gets up and Virginia just caves. That's not how Bronco coaches. That's not the culture that he's instilled up there. Um, so this is not an easy out. I do think North Carolina is more talented, and that's one of the reasons I think a lot of people feel North Carolina should win this one uh, handily. I'm not quite sure, but but possibly yes. It's going to be a, a game that North Carolina should expect to win. Yeah, if you look at Bronco Mendenhall's career, um, this is his fifth season at UVA. Two and ten the first year, took over a dumpster fire. Um, one and seven in the in the ACC, six and seven the next year, eight and five the next year, nine and five the the, the last year when they won the Coastal, and now they're one and four. So they kind of peaked as you would expect. Probably lost a little talent, and why their records is suffering. But as Greg said, uh, maybe not as bad as they as they look on paper. Gregory, you you write a lot of the previews for us. What, what have you kind of seen so far, and what you took away from what the coordinators and Mac Brown said about the Cavaliers? Yeah, I uh, I didn't get to ask Jay Bateman this. I just kind of get, asked him a straight up, what's your scouting report of Virginia? But I was going to ask him, Virginia doesn't allow a lot of sacks. They've only allowed nine sacks uh, all season, which is tied for first in the ACC with, uh, I think, two other schools. I'm not sure who. Um, this UNC pass rush has not been as dominant as maybe people thought. I don't know if anyone – if us or anybody really thought they would be dominant. It's probably – the wrong word there, but better than they have been. Um, they, they started off strong where they have seven sacks in week one, um, but I don't think they've had more than maybe three or four since then. Um, so I think that's really what I'm going to be watching is what can Chaz Surratt do? What can Tamon Fox do? Uh, can Tamari Fox get back there as well? Um, Jeremiah Gimmel, sometimes they threw, they give, they put him uh, in a block. You never, you never quite know what Jay Bateman's going to do. Um, as far as Virginia's defense, like I was saying earlier, their passing defense has been very weak. They did a good job of shutting down De'Ara King, um, but 
I still don't think that they can shut down the amount of weapons uh, that UNC has in receiver. If Bo Corrales is still hurt, that might be a little different story as far as how much are they going to get the ball to Emory Simmons. Um, I mean, he played great, um, but can he do that a second week in a row for, for the young guy? Uh, so it'll be interesting to see. I mean, Javante Williams and Michael Carter are almost guaranteed to have a decent game. They might not both go for 100 because the UVA rushing defense, like Mac talked about, is big. Uh, they got guys 6'3", 6'5", 6'7", 6'4", all in the box. Um, but I'm, it'll be interesting to see what, what Bronco and what their defensive coordinator does. Will they pack the box and be like, you know what, throw it. You're going to probably beat us throwing the ball anyway, but we're going to make you stop the run. Or are they going to be like, our passing defense is not good. We're going to make you beat us on the ground. So it'll be interesting to see what, what transpires. Yeah, and UVA runs a lot of different quarterbacks. I mean, I think Bateman right. mentioned the Wildcat a lot. Um, have you seen that, Greg, and how they're kind of rotating the quarterbacks? It seems like UNC's had trouble with running quarterbacks, and Bateman made a point that Mac Brown's been pretty upset with how they're handling running quarterbacks. So that's just another element to think about. Yeah, the Armstrong, I think, has had some injuries. So Lindell Stone has been another guy that they've, they've gotten a pretty good number of snaps at quarterback for them. Uh, but Broncos use a lot of different looks um, on both sides of the ball. And I think that's one of the, the interesting things about him is that he's very, very creative, um, kind of in a, in a traditional sense, if you will. And so, yeah, you know, and I asked Mac about the running quarterback issue last week and, and Bateman. Um, and, it, you know, there's just no way to really defend it if there's a, a, a team that has a good running quarterback. Mm -hmm. and that's why it's going to be an issue when North Carolina has to play. I mean, Sam Hartman's going to be a good test for Wake. Uh, Derek King, of course, is going to be an issue. Ian Book, even. Um, you know, these are, these are guys that, that North Carolina is going to have a tough time with, and that's really going to strain that, that defense. And that puts a lot of pressure on Bateman to scheme, to kind of protect. Uh, because as he said, you know, if you're playing man, well, your defensive backs have their back to the quarterback. And so if there's an opening, that quarterback can run and be 10 yards down the field before anybody knows that he's running. Um, and if you sit in zone, then all of a sudden you're exposing yourself in the passing game. So I think it's one of those things that it's not just a Bateman issue. It's not just a North Carolina issue. Everybody has those issues. That, that's part of the, the schematics right now, uh, the puzzle, the, the chess, chess piece that defensive coordinators are trying to answer this, and nobody's really come up with a good idea yet unless you just have a, a ton of talent like a Clemson or Alabama. Yeah, and, and UNC is, is 3-0 you know, at home, and they've lost one on the road, and they struggled on the road at Boston College. So the, the away game, it, it seems like it, there's a little bit of a trend here. That's another element to consider as UNC heads up to Charlottesville for an 8 p.m. kickoff on the ACC Network. All right, that's enough UVA preview. Uh, you'll definitely get more of that this week, um, especially when Greg, Jason, Tommy are on the Game Plan podcast, which has become a – Saturday tradition for myself as I take in the, the lovely tones of Greg and, and Jace's long-winded answers. Um, all right, basketball. Let's get loose on this one, guys. Uh, we're, we're still – I guess we're almost actually – yeah, we're less than a month from the first game. It's going to be College of Charleston. We had media day last Wednesday. Uh, we were all on those calls. You know, UNC had little Zoom issues to start. Josh Graham radio had a little audio issues midway through. It was kind of a, a, a touch and Come go. Come on, Josh. Come on. Touch and go. I'm sure Josh doesn't listen to this podcast. It was a touch and go he kind might. of Zoom, Zoom press conference there at the beginning, but uh, Steve Kirschner got his rhythm. We had Garrison Brooks. Um, he was in Andrew Playtack, the senior guard, and then Leaky Black. And then we had Roy Williams for a good 20 or so minutes. Um, I threw some topics up on Slack. But, I mean, we can kind of take us where everyone go. I mean, UNC, you know, they bring in six freshmen. They return Garrison Brooks. They return um, Leaky Black and Andrew Playtech and Armando Baycott. Sterling Manley also potentially a factor down the line. Greg, what are you going to be looking for early on, storylines, things we're writing about? Let's just kind of go from there, and we can just jump in and go back and forth on this 2020-2021 Tar Heel basketball team. Well, it seems like every preseason we're talking about injuries, and uh, this is yet another year. We still don't know Sterling Manley's uh, return time, but 
more important for North Carolina right now is Anthony Harris. Mm -hmm. The fact that he has not yet been cleared to practice. And the reason that's important is because without Harris there, I think a lot of us have kind of expected him to be a, a key figure in that backcourt for North Carolina. Uh, assume that Leaky Black's going to be at the three. But if Harris is not ready to go, that really leaves you with two guys. And that's Caleb Love and R.J. Davis, two freshmen. Um, and so that, I think that's the biggest storyline right now entering the season is you do those two guys live up to their height. Um, both are, you know, both have been described by players and Roy kind of as scoring guards, combo guards, both can play point. I think that's beneficial. That takes pressure off of each of them. If whoever can get the rebound and go can handle the rock, uh, it makes it a lot easier. Cole Anthony had a, a lot of responsibility on his shoulders last year because he was really the, the main point guard option. But now if you have two of those guys, you can alleviate some of that pressure. I think that's the, the key. And then, then from there, it's really, hey, after North Carolina has had to rely on Justin Pierce and even Luke May to an extent playing a, a, as a big guy when they're really not true bigs, now you've got four. If Manley comes back in time, five legitimate big guys. Mm -hmm. uh, Garrison so Brooks, I, I think, without – go ahead. I was just, I just quickly going to say, I think Garrison's the smallest out of the four. Yeah. Right. Which is right. kind of crazy to yeah. think about. <laughs> He should never have to play the five. And that's um, what he said, yeah. Yeah. So that's good for Garrison. That's good for his pro prospects because that allows him to slide outside some and not only defend, but actually make some of those shots. And so yeah. you have a lot of big guys there that Roy can really utilize. Um, and so that should take pressure off the backcourt as well. A lot to dissect there. I mean, I think this is one of those years where, you know, it, it's going to be freshman dependent and they'll go as these freshmen go. I mean, if, if for some reason Caleb Love struggles, I think the team will struggle. They're going to have to rely yep. on R.J. Davis to, to be a factor. I don't think he's going to be as critical as Love. And I'm really looking forward to Dayron Sharp. I mean, I think he is going to be awesome. I, I think I think he probably – it'll be that discussion where does he play over Armando Baycott? That'll be just a, a thing people start asking 10, 15 games in. Uh, I think he's a better overall player. Now I'm basing this on, you know, YouTube highlights and, and what Sherelle tells me, but I think Dayron's be awesome and I'm excited to watch him play. Another thing I took away from the press conferences we had was the fact that, you know, Love and Davis are our score first guards, but also kind of they play like Roy Williams wants them to play. They're both very quick. They're both athletic. They're both be pushing the ball up the, up the court like Roy Williams likes. And it, UNC should have one of the best rebounding teams in the nation kind of getting back to that bread and butter that Roy likes to do with, with dominating the paint. And De'Ron Sharp, according to multiple people, is one of the best offensive rebounders uh, they've ever seen. And, and that's, you know, from guys who've scouted for, for 10 or plus years and from players who've watched a lot of basketball. Gregory, uh, quick takeaways. What, what, what's, what are you looking for? What do you take away from some of these press conferences, a couple of takes you have on, on what we should expect from this UNC team? Yeah, to your point about R.J. Davis and Caleb Love, um, someone brought up in the press conference, someone asked uh, if that – or the point that this team is as good as, Leaky as good as Leaky Black is, which I thought was interesting um, just because I don't necessarily see Leaky Black as – like they don't – the team doesn't run through him. So I thought that was an interesting point to bring up, but I wanted to bring that up to y'all, what you thought. But why I don't think it's nice, this team it does isn't reliant on Leaky. Obviously, they need him to be healthy because he is can do everything um, and his length on the perimeter, which they don't necessarily have other than him with Justin Pierce gone. Um, but if RJ and Caleb can't get the ball into the bigs, that's where this team's going to struggle just off the bat because there's 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 four of them. Walker Kessler, Daron Sharp, Armando Baycott, Garrison Brooks. And it's exactly what Roy Williams wants. RJ and Caleb to push the tempo, get the ball to the big guys. But if RJ Davis and Caleb Love can't get the ball into the paint, which is where we saw Cole Anthony struggle a little bit and therefore kind of saw this team, the team fall apart last season, that's where the struggles are going to be. I don't necessarily think it's, oh, Leaky Black's hurt or they're screwed. It won't be good if Leaky Black is not 100% and the team will be better if he is healthy. But to say that this team can be as good as Leaky Black is good, I didn't necessarily see that. I could be wrong, but what did, what did you guys yeah. think yeah, of that? I, mean, 
I think I mean I think a healthy, really good Leaky Black makes this team really, really good. But I don't think he's a critical right. You know, they're not gonna live or die by him. But I mean when he if he can play like he's kind of flashed at times, I mean I think you can you have a special team because then you kind of all have all the parts. They can find a two guard if Anthony Harris is healthy or or RJ Davis kind of lives up the expectations and you have a, a really good lineup with some with some depth piece depth pieces as well. Um Greg, what I mean you wrote about Leaky Black last week. What do you kind of think about what he can do this season. I know it all depends on his health. Let's just say he's healthy for every game. Yeah. The fact that he's been injured really for two years, um, you know, and Roy Williams has has been high on him in terms of like, Hey, this is a kid that can play point uh, at college level and at the next level potentially. Um, And we just haven't been able to see exactly what all he can do. Is he a great scorer? No, he's not. Um, but some of some of Roy's greatest teams, I mean, whether it's a Marcus Ginyard or a Jack Emanuel, um, you know, various other guys who you know, may not be this high in score, but they can do a little bit of everything. And, you know, if you need somebody to come in and play point for a few minutes, if somebody gets hurt or somebody gets in foul trouble, he can do that. Uh, he can play defense because he's so long. He's a good passer. I mean, you know, he can maybe help out and against zone looks, you know, against what Syracuse does, just things like that. Um, he can do a lot of different things that, that could help the team. And you like, you, you know, the, the glue guy ideas, cliche, I know, but it's true. And if you have somebody who's a veteran, who's a good leader, who can do a lot of different things to help you that maybe don't all show up on the stat sheet, uh, you love to have those types of guys. And I think when you have so much scoring around him, all of a sudden that relieves that pressure of, hey, I've got to score – and he can just get rebounds, and he can attack, um, and he can do everything that he does. And I think that's very beneficial to have. Have we seen him do that? I think we saw it a little bit at the end of last year once Cole came back and he was able to play some on the wing and kind of get into a groove. But we haven't seen him really play completely healthy. And so I think we need to see him do that first, and then we can really project forward what all he can do. Yeah, and he's healthy right now. I mean, he's big. I mean, he's sick. He's a true six eight. He's long. He says he's been getting the weight room a lot. He said he's really, you know, working to strengthen his legs and his ankles. You know, that micro stuff that you do over time, and it just helps you prevent injuries. You see that from the football team. I think they've been doing a lot of that kind of stuff. That just really strengthening the muscles around the different joints, things like that. Um, so yeah, we don't know who's going to play the two. It seems right now. I imagine R.J. Davis is at the two with this team with, with Harris not even being able to do five on five. Um, and I thought it was interesting that Kobe White's been working out with them. I think the last week or so we saw him in a video that UNC released and really made a point to mention that, that he has really shown kind of the younger players, what it takes to, to play at the highest level and just the aggressive mentality that he brought. So I thought that was another cool point. I think Garrison Brooks is going to be, you know, kind of what we expect, maybe not score as much, may not be as much as a big a part of the offense because they won't need him to. Armando Bacot, you expect him to take that big leap. We're talking to him on Wednesday. And like I said, it's all going to be about the freshmen and whether some of these other guys can step in and knock some shots down. I think Leaky Black also needs to be able to have a shot as a threat and then do all little things like like Greg mentioned. I think he can play some four if they need him to, and he can play the one, the two, the three, and then defend. Uh, um, anything, anything left, Gregory? Yeah, I don't think that – I don't necessarily agree with you that Garrison Brooks, they don't need him to score as much. I think they do, at least early. Um, because if you look back returning scores from last year, um, Cole's gone. He obviously missed a lot. But I, I just – Armando Baycott was more of a rebounder than a scorer. We don't know what Dayron Sharp can do offensively just yet. We'll have to watch that. But I think early on, I think Garrison needs to set the tone of, look – we're going to score more than last year and it's going to start with Garrison because RJ Davis and Caleb love. Yes. They can score the ball based on what, like you mentioned, watching YouTube highlights. Um, But I really do think that Garrison's going to need to score the ball. He's been working on his jump shot, uh, which I have a running joke with a few of my friends, but I was going to ask you guys over under 12 and a half, three point attempts for Garrison Brooks this season. Attempts. I'll go over on that. You think so? Yep. Yeah, sure. He'll who's going to try to show what he can do to the NBA, and twelve is not that many. You get you get two or three just on last second scenarios. He only shot seven last year. It's a new year, man. Twenty twenty is a weird year. He's also uh, playing center. 
I just don't, yeah, I just don't think they're going to have to rely on him as much as score. I think Caleb Love and RJ Davis are, are going to be scoring a lot of points. And I think Armando Bacot, Dayron, we will be scoring as well. But it's good they don't have to rely on him as much. Yeah, I sure. think that helps the team overall. But yeah, I think he can. I mean, he scored what twenty five plus in, in the last six games or so. Um, all right, we'll get into a lot more of this. Obviously, on the beat, we'll be covering the basketball team throughout the season. Um, as we close here, at uh, anything else on on sports? We good? All right, UVA, UNC. I, I have two questions for Greg on the beat related. I want the first one. We got Luke Buxton and John Bowman. I want you to tell me, those are our last two video guys. I want you to describe how they are different for our <laughs> listeners. Luke Buxton's our current video intern. John Bowman, we both all three know. He's actually my current roommate. As I was say, is he right next to you? Where I don't he? even know if you knew that, Greg. John Bowman's been living with me for the last I three, did not four, know that. three or four months. And he listens to the podcast. So I want what how are those two guys different? I think it'd be interesting for your perspective on this. From a it, what perspective? From, are we talking personality? Are we talking work quality? <laughs> I mean anything. Wow. Um I'm I'm at a loss. Um, <laughs> Luke has better style. Yeah, Luke yeah. Luke has better style. Um, John is sneaky with his, uh, stat knowledge. The yeah. fact that him and Pat James are buddying up over stats does not surprise me in the least. Um, I think kind of the, the, the big difference is, is that when John came aboard, uh, we didn't initially look at him strictly as a video guy, whereas that's kind of what, what Luke does. Uh, and, and John has kind of fit that role, even though he could do you know, some, some, some different things, but, um, a little bit different personality-wise. Uh, John, you know, if you talk to him initially, he's kind of more laid back and quiet. But once you once you get to know him, he opens up some. That's that's tough. Um, it's a lot easier kind of comparing those two because before them we had uh, we had Paige and who all else did we have? We had Diana. Diana. Um, Wide-ranging uh, video yeah. interns there. Yeah. yeah, very different people. John Boehm and Luke Buxton. So I think it's, I think it's funny comparing them to. All right, last question for Greg. Yeah, Lindsay. Uh, oh yeah, I can't forget. Lindsay, Lindsay will smack me if I don't mention her. So yeah, we've had a <laughs> wide wide mix there. What are the odds? Any of those uh, the last three you mentioned listen to this podcast? Slim. To uh, Lindsay probably. Really? Maybe. Yeah. If, if if you're listening, Lindsay, you can tweet at us. Last question for Greg. We we'll get out of here. Who do you like sitting next to better in the press box? Gregory Hall or Ross Martin? Because you have you have to. Well, actually, all right. And then describe the experience. You don't have to say who you like better. Yeah, you do. Because you have this season, we only get two seats, so it's been Greg and Gregory, or it's been Greg and Ross. He gets to travel with me. And and, and what are the benefits and, and negatives of each person sitting next? Give to us a five. Box? Give us a five page scouting report. MLS formatted essay. How about that? All right. So, how about this from a personal standpoint? <laughs> Uh, my wife will tell you this. I have a very unique ability because we have, we have kids and a dog to tune people out. <laughs> so when I am working, I don't hear anything around me. It's a crazy <laughs> skill. Um, now, and the reason that's important is, is because there are other people who say that Ross tends to be all over the place. He's the comedian in the room. Um, occasionally, he has some very funny jokes. Other times, they fall flat. Most Whereas of the time. Gregory is very much a, uh, as, I, as I said with, with John, more of a, a stat guy. And so he's more likely to uh, elbow me and say, hey, how about this set? How about this one? Or you'll see him over there pitching a fit because Auburn's getting beat in some sport. And uh, those are kind of the key things. But you guys keep me on my feet. It's, uh, I don't yeah. know if it makes it fun, but it makes it interesting. Gregory is definitely – I'm talkative, but Gregory's very talkative. What else are we supposed to do? Just sit there? Hey, I agree. I agree. Make it fun while you're in there. Yeah, I, it blows my mind how Greg is able to. I mean, he. I guess he's just not of the ADD, you know, 10-second attention span era, but he is zoned in. And it's like, you don't have earplugs in. You How can you not hear everything? But the two Greg is thing, so focused. I will literally repeat myself yeah, yeah. like four times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Because I feel like he's just ignoring me. And sometimes I'm like, I'll say it the first time. And then I'll wait because I'm like, oh, he's finishing writing his sentence. And he just doesn't stop. I'm just like, Greg. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, I mean, that's how he writes these great scoops and it has the um, instant analysis ready to go. Well, I'm just 
dicking our off. <laughs> our readers get 100% Greg Barnes. That's yeah, and it doesn't help that Adam Smith is now covering UNC, and so one of my best buddies and I are goofing around the whole time, and I have to reel myself in. But I think you should have fun. We're, we're covering a game. You're covering a inflated animal skin that's going across imaginary white lines on grass. Like, let's get a little fun with it. Yep. Their job is to catch a ball. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Ours is to write and, about and, it. And we're able to make money off of it. Right. All right, guys, that was fun. Uh, hopefully you got a good idea of kind of what's going on with UNC football right now. I mean, not many injuries. They're rolling one of their best complete games against Virginia – against sorry, against NC State. Who knows how good NC State really is. We'll have a better idea of how good this team really is if they can kind of run off three wins against Virginia. Um, Duke should be, should be easier. And then Wake. Wake's playing pretty well. And then, and then it kind of gets really, really tough uh, after that. Um, and then basketball season. I mean, this is the busy time. Basketball's pushed a little bit back, but uh, we're kind of having the crossover season now. For Gregory Hall and Greg Barnes and Ross Martin, thanks for listening to the Inside Carolina Podcast presented to you by Johnny T-Shirt and johnnytshirt.com.